start recording. So, hey, welcome. My name is Amanda Day, and we're here with Minwift Mondays. It's the Minnesota Women in Film and Television. Every other Monday about, we try to get someone that um, we think would add a lot of education and experience and knowledge and hopefully humor, Winona, to us all sitting at home and um, get a little bit of a conversation going about the film and television industry. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Probably keep yourself on mute while we are um, in, in conversation, just so like you don't have things happen, like my dog just starts randomly barking, which happens sometimes. Although if it does, it's no big deal. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat at the end, probably 20 minutes before seven, we'll open it up to conversation. We'd love for you to um, ask questions and have this become a more of a dynamic conversation. Um, I'm really excited to introduce my personal friend, Winona Wilms. She just won the Nichols, the McKnight, and the Austin, which is kind of a trifecta of greatness in the screenwriting world. Um, and we're just super excited to have her with us talking. She she lives in Minnesota as well, which is, is pretty cool. I'm going to let our friend Molly in. Um, I think we want to start out with the question, can you tell us the skeleton of a great script? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, well, this would be pretty basic information that uh, anybody that would be starting screenwriting would be able to find. Um, are we talking a feature script, a TV script, a short script? Let's actually talk about maybe some of the differentiation there. Maybe we don't need to talk about shorts, but let's definitely go into features and um, a series. Sure. So, uh, feature, three act structure. Um, <clears throat> I generally tend to start uh, with character when I'm writing a, any any script, no matter what format it is. Um, and you have your basic sort of roadmap, and I'm sure all of you know this and, and have heard this before. You have um, your first 10 pages, this is a skeleton, your first 10 pages, you're getting to know your character. It's your one shot. Your first 10 pages are the most important uh, pages in your screenplay uh, to establish the character, meaning what are their flaws? What are, you know, who are they? What's, what is it like in their world before shit starts to go wrong? Um, by page 15, you're going to have what's called an inciting incident, which is the fly in the ointment. What, what, what event happens? that is going to set them off on this, this journey. Um, so for instance, like Harry Potter, you know, um, it's your wizard Harry, this, that, this kind of thing, right? What, what's gonna shake up their world? We then go to the first act, so that's 15 pages is your inciting incident. End of the first act would be about 25 pages, um, which is when you're establishing your goal. You've hopefully met your antagonist or representative of your antagonist by now. Um, and then we run into the, what we call the, the second act blues, which is the worst part of your screenplay that you hate and you usually <laughs> abandon it at this point. <laughs> uh, let's see, I bet a lot of people have like screenplays that are about 50, 60 pages long that you just decide this isn't any fun anymore. Maybe screenwriting's not for you and you walk away. Um, for those of you brave enough, you continue through the second act blues all the way to the, the climactic moment and then you have like the resolution and all that all the way up to 90 pages minimum uh, for a feature. I wouldn't go higher than 110, but you know, 120, 130 is, is okay, acceptable too. Uh, TV is a little different. Obviously you can draw this out for 10 episodes, ideally eight to 10 episodes. You have a limited series, which uh, would be your whole story then in those 10 episodes, or you would want to then pitch out a second season, third season, how far can you go? Pilots are all about world building. Um, they're hard to write because you have to cram a lot of information into the, your 50 page pilot. Um, and it doesn't really get fun until you're able to write the rest of the series, which usually you don't get a chance to do that. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So I know you can't say much, but can you tell us about the big fun thing that just happened for you? I can say some things um, because we're tape recording this. I don't, you know, if it was just us, if it was just us, you guys, like I could totally like tell you all the juicy dirt. Um, but yeah, so I recently 
sold a pitch to Netflix. Um, I'm waiting for the contracts to be signed, which is taking a long, long time. Um, but it's really, really exciting. So I will be a co-creator uh, writing a pilot, a television pilot for a series. Um, I can't tell you a ton, I apologize. Uh, it is Native American based. Uh, it's based on a book and I'm really, really, really excited. And I'm very fortunate that I can do it here at home now, which I was, I've been, if you guys know me, you know I've been a little bit nervous about, um, <laughs> I've been really scared to get a job, but you know, like I've been, I've been nervous about uh, going into TV and getting staffed as a writer, which, uh, t you know, if you're a writer, you really want to get on a TV show, but I did not want to move to LA. I don't, I don't want to be in LA, um, but I'm very fortunate. The, the pandemic has blessed me just a little bit with being able to stay home and, and, and do, a, do a writer's room here. So very exciting. So as you're in this writer's room and as you're creating this world, world building, as you're talking about, can you talk about one of the most important parts of writing and writing something that we want to watch, which is creating characters that are not only believable, but characters that are flawed, characters that are lovable and hateable. Can you talk a little bit about building that person? Um, I think fortunately for us, uh, we had IP, which is uh, intellectual property, which means that the characters were sort of already built out for us in the novel. Um, and, and luckily also when we got to talk to the author, we got to kind of pick her brain a little bit and tell her our ideas for the characters and some, you know, taking them in different directions and if that was cool. And I don't think you usually do that. I mean, once you get, you know, the author's uh, rights to the book, you can do whatever you want. But I thought it was very respectful of the company that I'm working with to, to approach the author about that. But um, I think that when writing characters, for, it's just, it's, I hear a lot um, the word authentic you really make your characters authentic. And it's, when they say that, normally it's because I'm writing something Native American. I'm Native American, I'm writing Native American characters, it's authentic. Um, and I think that people really like to be able to, to go into places and worlds and meet people that they wouldn't have an opportunity to meet. I think that's really important, especially with, with this project. Um, and I just, it's, it's all about vulnerability. It's all about making someone interesting on the page. It's about giving the actors something to, to, to be excited about, right? I mean, I will, I, every character I write, no matter if they're the main character or even a, a, a smaller you know, side character or, or whatever, you have to give an actor something to be excited about. You have to give them good dialogue. You have to put them in scenes that, that no one's seen before and make them want to do this, you know, to, to be in your script. Because that to me is the most like, um, it's a great, uh, it's very flattering <laughs> when actors say, I want to do this. I want to be in this, this, this film, this movie, because you've written this character that I've never seen before and I really want to play. And that's, that's a really big deal, I think, for this, for everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about that because for me on the other side, on the acting side, I have a certain process that I go through. I... I go through and, and start to figure out the music this character likes. I go through and start to figure out like, are there some childhood wounds that maybe have were never in the script, but those smaller things that kind of inform you so that when you're in the moment, you can be in the moment rather than having to rely only on words. How do you find these idiosyncrasies in characters? Because one of the things, and I've written a, a read a lot that you, of what you've written, dialogue does feel very natural and i think a lot of people suck at that so talk a little bit about finding those characters voices authentic if you want to say yeah yeah um there's there's different techniques a lot of writers use um there sometimes they fill in sheets like bio bios backgrounds what's what's their you know what did their parents do when you know what's your sun sign stuff like that like some some writers will go very to a very extensive length to sort of dig into the character's head um I've never, I've never done that. It, it might work for, I don't know if it would work for me. Um, it seems like it might just be a, a, a way to spend some time not writing, doing that. <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, you know, one thing is you need, when you're putting your character in these scenes, you're, you're giving them obstacles to overcome. You're, you're, you're giving them things that they have to work on. And so everything that comes out of a character is based on what's pushing against them. You know, who's, who's against them and how do they react? Do they run away? Do they overcome it? Do they, you know, and so there's a lot of, um, you know, you, you get that from your family, your friends, and of course, you get it from everywhere you look. I'm a big um, people watcher, you know what I mean? I love to sit back anywhere I go where there's crowds. I watch people like crazy. I watch their body language. If I can get close enough, I listen to their um, dialogue. Dialogue's the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing. To me, it sort of comes in last, you know, a, as a writer because it's you have to listen to people say your words and if you're sitting at home writing for years and years and years which i did um and then you get the opportunity to work with actors and you actually start hearing your words coming out of different people's heads instead of just your own you're like oh that's terrible that's terrible writing so it's it's just a different it's a different part of the process mm -hmm. um is getting getting that natural sound and Something that I always say, I don't know why I always say it, but I do. Um, it, to me, it's a little bit like Scooby-Doo. Every, every character has to have their own distinct voice, right? Um, and, and if you think about Scooby-Doo, if you just go rut row or jinkies or my glasses, shit like that, like you know automatically who that character is. It doesn't take a lot. You just have to make sure that your voice doesn't sound the same coming out of every character. Um, because it, it, you can't, you know, tell who's who on the page. It, yeah. It's boring. It's really boring. And then they all sound like you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, a lot of times when I think about characters, I think about the tension, those tension lines they have between all the people around them. And sometimes that tension can be love. Sometimes it can be mistrust. Sometimes it can be revenge. Sometimes it can be, uh, you know, excitement. But what are those strings between each character and the people around them or a place or something that's happened. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you about um, this idea of finding the goal because you've talked about finding the goal for the character, but there also has to be the goal for the film. And I know you've struggled with that lately, like using other people's IP. Sometimes it's like, okay, uh, what is, what's the goal here? So can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, so the goal is sort of the whole backbone of your story. Um, your character has a goal, has a goal at the beginning where they, let's say the end of act one and by the end of the script, they are going to either achieve, you hope, or not achieve this goal. And so the entire script is built around this goal. Every scene should be referencing this goal, even if it's very subtextual. Right, um, and it's and you usually have sort of an inside goal and an and a outer goal, an inner emotional goal that the character has a, a flaw that they have to overcome, um, and that's going. They need to overcome this inside goal to to reach their outside goal. It's all very sort of connected in that way. Um, but the antagonist of your film is now going to have the opposite goal as of your protagonist, and that's how you create a you know, the, the tension that you said, the conflict. The conflict is king in any screenplay. Every single scene needs to have conflict. It needs to have people not getting along, people fighting, disagreeing. I mean, the most boring thing to read and to watch is people getting along. Like, nobody wants to see that, you know what I mean? And, and you should come over and hang out at my quarantine house with two teenagers. Plenty of conflict. Drama is very exciting to watch. It gets your heartbeat going, and you know, and I, I think I sat down and watched, you know, episode after episode of Breaking Bad just to kind of test this, and every single scene in Breaking Bad has conflict in it. Even if it's very, you know, very subtle, it, you know, it could just be a look or an action. It doesn't have to be words. They don't have to be fighting, but there's conflict, conflict, conflict throughout. And it's beautiful. It's, mm -hmm. that's what makes it so well written. What have you, now I know you've been pitching a lot. Um, what have you found to be the commonalities in stories that you're pitching that people are really connecting to? Um, so, By connecting to, I mean, they want it. They, well, so here's the thing. So 
Um, writing spec scripts or scripts that come out of your head is very, it's, it's very rare that that's something that's going to sell. Um, original screenplays are tough, tough sell and not because they're not great. It's because it's hard to get them in front of people. Um, and then once you get to a point where you have, an, you know, you have people that are willing to look at your scripts, an agent, a manager, a producer, they don't want to see that anymore. Now they want to give you their IP so that you can pitch that out. And yeah. so it's this really awful game of busting your ass for years and years to come up with these original, wonderful screenplays for them to say, this is a great writing sample. Now we're going to you know, hook you up with this guy over here who's got a comic book he wants you to pitch out. And, and so it, it really changed the way that I have thought for so, so long about how this business works. Being here in Minnesota, um, not being in the industry so much as a writer, it's, I thought I was gonna go sell a screenplay. And then I would write another screenplay and sell that screenplay because everyone loved the first screenplay I sold. And then I would just make a lot of money. And <laughs> the, the script that I won, uh, the, the nickel and the Austin and all that with, I would think, I think is one of my, one of my best screenplays. Um, and I thought, great, I'm going to get this agent and a manager and I'm going to sell this script. Like I was 100% sure. I mean, the nickel, you know, I'm going to sell it. Um, it's still available, <clears throat> but it's been a writing sample and it's been sent out to, uh, you know, I've been on 50 general meetings in the last year. It's been sent out across LA um, and I've been getting a lot of um, opportunities to look at IP, a lot of opportunities to pitch. Um, I've been able to sit across from amazing people that I never thought I'd be in a room with and have them go, I loved your script. I mean, and that was really, really, you know, awesome. But the whole pitching thing is a, it's a different game. And it's, it's, I feel like I'm starting all over again in this, in this business and relearning how to do something that I don't know how to do. Because <laughs> well, when you think about being a writer, you really don't think about being a razzle dazzle, you know, show person. Let's talk about pitching. I mean, right. I know it's not your favorite thing. What makes a bad pit, pitch? What makes a good pitch? And if you're, you're not natural at this, what should you be trying to do? If you know me, and half of you, I think, know me, you know that um, speaking in public, speaking in front of people, doing anything like that has been a really big challenge for me. Uh, it's, it's been, I'm an introvert. I'm a writer, just like you said. And I thought, I was gonna, I'm going to get through this you know, career just with my head down and not having to perform. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been a, a big wake up call, a big lesson for me. I've been thrown into the deep end of the pool. Um, the very first uh, big pitch that I got, <laughs> uh, and, and you know, I talked to my agents, I don't really know what pitching is. I've never seen a pitch. And weirdly enough, people don't tape record their pitches when they're pitching Disney, right? It's, it's almost like everything happens between closed doors and you hear about pitches, and, but you don't, you've never seen one. No one has ever seen one. It's like Bigfoot. So I had to sort of figure it out. I've, I've watched videos, I've read books, I've asked people, and they all just say, you just gotta do it. You just gotta practice. You'll get better at it, you know, okay. So the very, very, very first pitch that I did that was terrifying was to Elizabeth Banks Company. Um, and it was for a book. It was for a young adult book, similar to like the Maze Runner or the one with the girl with the thing. Anyway, um, it was a young adult book and uh, they want your take on it. Now this is like the worst part ever. You read the book, you read the article, and they don't want you to write what you just read, which was an amazing story that obviously sold millions of copies and, and, you know, they paid millions of dollars for the rights to this. They don't want you to write that. They want you to come up with your own take. How are you going to make it different? How is the character going to be different? How, and I'm like, I, I like it the way it is. I would like to write it the way it is. Right. <laughs> so, and, and being here in Minnesota, I got on the phone with, um, the execs, the executive producers over at Elizabeth Bank company, cause she was going to, um, direct this movie. And um, I pitched the story. I, I wrote, I read the book many, many times. I had a stack of cards. I had it all organized and I thought I knew what I was doing. And I got on the phone and basically just went, and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens. And it was 45 minutes of dead silence on the other side. 45 minutes I talked to nothing. And I, I, like, I couldn't even hear them breathing. Um, I was sweating, I was shaking, I was pacing. 
And they're like, okay, thanks. Um, and that was pretty much it. And then my agents called me and they're like, they're going to take it another direction. So that was like, that was my first pitch and it was absolutely terrifying and horrible. And I felt sick and I never wanted to do it again. And I told everyone I was going to quit and that I was done with this just, you know, career. <laughs> this is what screenwriting is. I'm never doing it again. Um, <laughs> and I've said that a couple more times. Uh, <laughs> we've now moved forward a year and a half and I'm finally, finally understanding what it's all about. I'm getting it. Um, there's, there's, there's emotional beats to your story that that's all they care about. They don't want to hear and then and then and then. They don't care about plot. They want you to take your protagonist on this emotional journey, you know, the ups and the downs through the story and how that affects them so that, that when your audience is sitting there listening to your pitch, it will affect them emotionally. It's all about emotions. Um, luckily, <laughs> I haven't had to do it in person because of the, you know, the situation now. So I've been able to do a lot of pitches this way, video. Um, I've been using lookbooks, which has been a super exciting. Like I can share my screen and go through, you know, things like that. Um, I've been, <laughs> at, at one point I had uh, some wine boxes and shoe boxes and I taped all of my stuff up behind my laptop so that I wouldn't, you know, so I could look in my camera and go, and then, then, you know, and, and do my pitch that way. I mean, I've, I've done all kinds. Of <laughs> it's been really, it's been really, um, it's been my own education because nobody taught me how to do this. And I've just been learning pitch after pitch after pitch. Um, and I'm finally, I'm finally not terrified. I finally know what I'm doing. I think that I'm, I'm getting better at it, but I still really, really dislike it quite a bit. <laughs> Can you say who you're pitching to next? Um, I will be pitching to uh, Nickelodeon for a project that I'm hoping we'll be shooting here in Minnesota. It's a feature. And again, they came to me. They, they came to me with this idea and asked me to develop it for them. So. It must be really interesting as a writer interpreting another writer's world. How, what, like, what is your process for taking a book and morphing it into, you know, you're taking a book that's 400 pages and you're condensing it often into 110. What is your process for that? And that's, that's pretty much exactly it. It's, um, you have to figure out what is visual, what's going to loan itself visually because film is a visual medium. So anything that if, if your main character is taking you into the past to talk about their childhood, you know, is that really important to what's happening right now on the film? Probably not. Um, you can't go into their heads and things like that. Thing, things that you read, you just, if you can't write it down on the page, you can't obviously, you know, watch it. So you're, you have to cut out a lot of that extra stuff. You cut out um, subplots sometimes. You combine characters. Um, you, it's a, it's a really big, it's a puzzle, which I love. I love, I mean, screenwriting for me is always a big puzzle. So I love that part of it anyway. Um, but it is really challenging. It's because uh, you don't know if you're doing it right. If there is a right or wrong, it's literally your take. How would you do it? And you could be pitching against four or five other screenwriters with their takes. So if, even if your take is better, your pitch might be worse and you're going to lose that job. But um, it's, uh, and, and that's part of the thing that I thought was really cool with this uh, Netflix project is that we were able to talk to the author. Um, and I don't know if it was, because uh, we're all Native American and we just sort of wanted it to be respectful because I also do not want to mess with other people's words, like another writer, that kind of hurts my heart a little bit. And I wanted her to know and, and sort of be okay with the, the direction we were taking some of these characters because it's a series, because we have to go, you know, 10 episodes in. So we really needed to develop things a little bit differently. And, and it was, I think she was grateful that we, we did that, it was nice. As you're doing that, are you building a, like a story arc? Are you building a timeline, a skeleton, and then you're putting things into place? Yeah, you, you, so you know where you're starting, you know where you're ending, so all you gotta do is fill in those. <laughs> That's all you have to do. <laughs> um, it's fun because you can, take, you can take minor characters and give them the, a whole story that they can, you know, it's the B, the B plot and the C plot. Um, and, and, and go, go where they're gonna go. Um, 
And so it's, it's, it's <laughs> Do you have a favorite character that you've ever written? There we go. Say it again, Amanda. Do you have a favorite character that you've ever written? If it is Molly Katagiri on this, uh, she's on there somewhere, right? Yeah, Molly, you're on. Okay. Uh, yeah, she knows uh, the the woman named Audrey in a film that she uh, optioned from me and hopefully we'll make this movie. Um, I love Audrey quite a bit. She loves Audrey. Uh, Amanda, I think you actually did a table read and you were Audrey. <laughs> um, she, she stands out to me as, a, as one of my favorite characters. Um, I write male characters, but I, I love writing female characters because we're just so much more interesting. Um, <laughs> she's that. You know, she's a farm wife in the 1930s. It's the, it's the Great Depression. Uh, we're in Minnesota on a farm and there's a blizzard and she's, she's oppressed. She, um, she has postpartum depression. Um, she's a little bit evil. She's a little bit not evil. She's very complex. Mm -hmm. um, I've had so much fun writing her and continuing to develop her that um, she's one of my favorites. And then the Horsehead Girls, which is the nickel script, she's one of my favorites too. For, you know, I, in my mind, I was like, I want, it was my callback to Wind River, which is, you know, the, about the man camps and this Native American woman gets, um, you know, murdered right away. And so I wanted to write a film where the Native American woman doesn't get killed in the first 30 seconds of the film. And, and, and she is actually, you know, her, her protagonist she's her own hero she saves herself she's badass she's strong but she's just a normal woman she's a mother she works in a casino you know what i mean so um and that to me is just so much more interesting um mm -hmm. than you know like a like a superhero woman she's yeah. just an average woman that does what she needs to do to get through whatever she needs to get through i felt like i knew her pretty early on i felt like she was relatable because she's someone that, you know, we, you could easily have met, but you go on this journey with her that was intense, <laughs> very intense. Um, so Matt Bailey had a question that he sent me earlier. He wanted you to talk about the use of theme and how you kind of implement that throughout a, your story. Okay. Um, so this is something that... <laughs> What I'm about to say, I do not recommend you try at home. Um, I, do not, <laughs> I do not outline uh, when I write a screenplay. I think about it for a long time in my head. Sometimes I'll take my phone and start filling up like the little notes section <laughs> with little notes. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't ever sit down and physically outline it. I don't know why. To me, I like discovering it as I go. I sort of, I get as excited you know, writing it as I would watching a movie. So that's, that's sort of my, my process and it works for me. I've written a ton of scripts that way, so I'm not gonna change it. Um, however, a lot of people will, you know, build in their theme right away when they're thinking of the story or when they're outlining the story. And sometimes it depends on the genre or, you know, always your own personal, what are you trying to say? You know, like um, money can't buy love, or you know, with great power comes great. What you know, there's there's themes. There's all kinds of themes, um, and I think I don't know if it would be half and half, but a lot of times you don't discover your theme until you're done writing the script, and it sort of starts to come out uh, afterwards at the end when you start seeing it, um, and that's how it is for me. Like it comes out afterwards. Um, and it might even, you know, I'm, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if I could tell you the theme of half of my scripts. Other people tell me the themes of my, of my work because they probably yeah. see it more than I do. But so at the end, then once this theme has emerged, do you often go back and like see where it needs to be woven in? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I go back a lot um, because of my process. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't you know, foreshadow and set up and pay off and things like that as much, obviously, if I don't know what's happening. Um, but I will, I will go back and rewrite things to then put in place all the elements that will pay off down the line. And that does mean theme. If, if something thematically needs to come through, 
I will go back and, and rewrite, you know, scenes and things like that to, to address the theme for sure. So when you are thinking about a new story, do you start with a character that you like, ooh, that person's juicy? Or do you start with maybe even just seeing a scene in your mind? Or is it, do you see a, a larger overarching story? It's, it's usually a character. I'm, I, I'm more of a character writer than a plot writer. Um, because for me, plot's pretty easy and character comes out of plot, you know? Um, so I just, I love complex characters hundred percent. And yeah, I think, I think a lot of times I start with the opening, the opening scene where, where's my character? Where, who is, who is she or he? Where are they? What is going to happen? What just happened? Like, where did you just plop your person down? You know, and, and that's really like fun for me. And then, and then the character starts coming out. Like, are, are, do they have short, dirty nails? Are there, is their hair? You know, like I start building out the character and not just physically, but, but emotionally and, and all that as well. So I don't like the, to use the word always or never, <laughs> but what tropes should a writer probably not do or ones that make you crazy? Okay. I have one favorite one. And I think, I think if you, again, if you know me, I've said this a million times, do not open your script in the bedroom. Like <laughs> when you're, when your protagonist has the, the alarm clock goes off and you're going around the room and let's pan around. Oh, there's the movie poster. Or, you know, there's like the posters in their room. Are, are they dirty socks laying around? Is the dog begging for food? Like it's, it's a very, very easy way to introduce your character. It's very easy. And, but it's so overdone. Um, and I've written lots of scripts starting out in someone's, you know, waking up in the morning, brushing their teeth, whatever. Um, but there's just so many better ways to start a script. Um, it's just, it's overused a hundred percent. And if, if your script starts that way, see if you can just figure out a different way. I think, uh, when, um, when I was doing Waboo's the short film, again, Molly, uh, I, that was a big thing that we talked about because I don't remember if I started it out that way. I might have, um, but I was like, we can't do that. We have to start it a different, a different scene. Um, that's a big one. I just, ugh. do you ever like, and I think this is probably very different for a female writer, but I like to challenge um, the male writers to switch genders and see what happens. Because so often we have these like very tropey things about this is what women do, this is what men do, uh, which is why the term fridging came, like, because there's these tropes that we keep doing with this is what happens for your male protagonist story to get pushed along. Um, can you talk about anything else that you always want in your script? Are there any certain things that you're like, there's always going to be this in there? Yes. Um, with my native scripts, I always have an elder because elders are an extremely important part of our culture and our relationships. And to me, um, that's sort of a, I, I do family a lot, family themes in a lot of my screenplays. And, um, and especially for native, I, I have to have elders in there. I just, I couldn't imagine talking about native Americans without talking about elders. It's just, it's the right and respectful thing to do for sure. And then on the other end, I like I like kids once in a while. I like to write about children and teenagers because that's like, I mean, if you're talking conflict and, and volatility and, and you know what I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. a, that's a gimme, right? Like teenagers are, they're built, they're built in conflict no matter where they go. Um, and I was a really shitty teenager. And so I, I have a lot of material to pull from in my, in my past uh, life of, of um, conflict. And, and yeah, I love writing teenagers. I love writing elders. For sure, those would be the two. That's, that's interesting. And and directors love working with kids because it's so easy. Dogs or cats. I love cats. Sorry, Mom. Yeah. Um, Matt also had another question. Before winning the nickels, what contact contests and submissions did you find most helpful in getting your work out into the industry, getting to a place where people were saying, We have this IP, we want your take on it, we want your pitch. 
So do you mean like other, like other contests or other avenues right. besides contests? I would say any and all. Right. Okay. So again, this would be like a thing regional. So like being here, being in Minnesota as a screenwriter is sucks. It's a very, very hard, hard thing to do. We don't have the, the kind of network and infrastructure that LA has where everyone has a screenplay and every, you know what I mean? The, the community is so much better there for, for screenwriters. Um, so uh, the nickel, that, that's, the, that's the top of the line. That's something that I entered for um, every year for 16 years. Um, I tried to enter with a different screenplay every year because I thought it was important to, it, it, you know, it keeps you writing. You know, of course, if you want to keep submitting the same script over and over, that's fine. But let me tell you, like, once you get where you need to go, the first thing those agents and managers are going to ask is what else do you have? What else that you consider is highly polished and ready to go do you have? And if you've only been polishing the one turd up for five <laughs> years, that's all you have. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. uh, for me, it kept me writing and writing with a big arsenal of screenplays. Um, the nickel, number one, uh, Austin. And then funny enough, and I'm not just saying this, but it's, it's true. Like when I, when I uh, went to the, the nickel week that they have where you get to hang out with everybody and they set it themselves around the big table, the whole like academy committee was like, well, we all know that the Austin is the second best one, blah, blah, blah. And they didn't know that I had just won the Austin one too. And I was like, hey. so nickel and Austin is number, you know, one and two. Um, I did place a uh, gold comedy in the page awards, which was another one that I really, really liked over the years. I, I entered that one because they have, their categories have genre, they're genre specific. So you're only, you know, towards the end of it, you're only competing against other comedies or other horrors. And that was kind of fun. And that one, um, when I won that one, I actually got a manager for that. And that was in 2000, and I don't remember, 11, I think. Um, and that was a, a high concept comedy that I did, eventually then give to my agents a year and a half ago and they optioned that script so that that one I pulled out it was polished ready to go it was an award winner uh, and it was a high concept teen comedy you know fun script and I'm hoping they're they're supposed to be casting right now I'm a little nervous because there's it takes place in high school and I don't know if they're going to be able to shoot it but we'll see I think that's a great point talking about having a plethora of different genres and I can't remember what it was for. Was it for this that you had to have like something just ridiculous, like 20, oh, uh, by tomorrow, can you give us 25 teen comedy ideas? Yeah. You guys, everyone <laughs> listening, it was insane. And she's like, sure. <laughs> it, was, it was difficult. And that's, you know, that was one of my first uh, experiences with Hollywood and, and the representation game. Um, and I, the difference between a manager and agent, you know, there, there's a difference. And I had a manager for a hot second and literally he said, this is great. You're a teen comedy writer. We're going to sell you as a teen comedy writer. We can't sell you as anything else um, because you're going to confuse people. So what we need to do, and, and my teen comedy had a, like a supernatural element. There was ghosts in it. Um, so he's like, what I want you to do is come up with 25 log lines of other teen comedies with supernatural elements and, you know, in a week or whatever. Um, I did it and then I, and then I fired my manager. <laughs> um, so it was, it's, they really, you are a product, you know? Um, yeah. so it was, that was tough. That was tough. It always surprises me when, when other people are telling you who you are as a writer and also when they're telling you something like fairly narrow, it's like telling an actor, well, you only can play like the, you only can play action, but it's like, as an actor, if you can't play other things, you are not an actor. Exactly. Playing some version of yourself. Absolutely. But do you have a genre you love the most? Um, I, I, love, I love writing comedy and I love writing horror. And to me, they're kind of, the, the, they're the different sides of the same coin. To, you know, if you can elicit an, um, like a reaction, like, oh, or ha 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 in somebody, that, that, I love that, right? It's, um, yeah. I love comedy and I love horror. Those are high genres. They're hard, they're both very hard to write, but um, com or horror is a little easier to sell. Um, but then I do get stuck in these in a lot of drama. Um, <laughs> and 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 I'm of course 
um, asked to, to pitch out and write a lot of Native American stuff. And I get that, you know, there aren't very many Native American female screenwriters, um, but I don't know how many Native characters I have left running around inside my head because it's, a, you know, I, I like to write other things too. So I, I am sort of getting pigeonholed into this, I don't know if I even call it a genre, um, but I'm representing and I'm, I'm honored to be representing. And so it's something that I'm, that I love doing, but then, you know, for fun, I, I also like not writing about Native Americans all the time. However, I will say, um, during some of my general meetings, they, with, um, with like Get Out and everything, Jordan Peele, he had just, you know, he's been doing this, this elevated genre, in, incorporating, you know, his culture into it. And that's the next thing they're like, we really want to see a, a Native American horror. I'm like, well, you know, old white men scare me, what scares you, right? So like, I, it's, I think that they're really looking for something with, uh, you know, Indians coming out of the graveyard. And that's not something that I'm, interested in writing I, I do I'm, I'm interested in you writing that <laughs> that would be dark AF it would be amazing um one last question and then I want to open this up do you remember the first time you watched a film or read something or even wrote something and thought this is what I'm supposed to do I do. Um, and it's so it sounds tr trite, but the first screenplay that I ever ever wrote, um, I it was it's it was about my grandmother's boarding school experiences um, growing up, and so it was very very personal to me. Um, and the story, in my opinion, <laughs> was really really good. Uh, but I had the foresight to know that. I'm not ready for this story yet. This is a really good story. I'm very, I'm very connected to it, but I'm a beginner screenwriter. I don't really know what I'm doing. So then I went on to write my second and my third and my fourth. Um, and then I went back. I, every time I learned something new, I took it back to that first script because I knew that was a really special story. Um, yeah. And I incorporated like, and, and honestly, like I said, the last thing to come in on that particular script was um, dialogue because the dialogue was terrible. Of course it was, it was my first script. Um, but as I got better at dialogue, I would go back to that one and keep keep working it and working it. And then after mm -hmm. six years of writing that one, um, that one won the McKnight in 2007, eight, back, back then. Um, so I, it felt like I knew my instincts were right on, that that was a really special story. Yeah. Um, that the time that I gave it. You know, scripts two through seven were terrible, but that first one I know was, was special. So we have a few questions. Um, someone's asking, would you, you know, talk about that adage, write what you know? Is that something you always do? Have you written something where you don't, aren't familiar with it and you've had to do a ton of research for it? I'm kind of lazy. Uh, I hate research. I really do. Um, because it just, it distracts you again from, from right. You can get really, really lost in really minutia detail during doing too much research. Um, being human is a universal thing we all know. So like, for instance, like the, the Martian, right? I'm, of course he had to do research about Mars, but if you just take a person and put them on Mars, like I could do that because I know how people act, how they are. So I feel like you really need to balance out writing what you know about people, you know, and then, and then, you, you know, using whatever, whatever place you put them in. Um, I come up with ideas all the time that I think would be super cool that might have like military people in them or so. And I'm like, oh, but then I'm going to really have to research military. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I really have to be, I really, at this point in my, my career, I would really have to think it was really good idea that really needed some research to do it. Um, but I think write what you know is, I, I agree, but you know a lot. You know a lot being a human, you know a lot. So. Yeah. Another question is, can you talk about what the writer's room looks like? Do you get to pick your team? Does the studio provide that? Um, so I've never been in a writer's room. This, I think that my situation is very unique and I feel extremely lucky to, um, 
skip past the staff writer um, position because that's where people start out is they they're you know writers assistants staff writers there's a whole bunch of different um levels of writers room people that i don't know about um i've seen a lot on panels <laughs> um but yeah so i'm gonna i will be able to me and my co-creator are going to select uh i think about five or six writers to be in our in our writers room um i again i think this particular one is going to look different just because it's all going to be virtual so i don't know how that's going to work um, i have a whiteboard in my office and i think it's going to be a lot of hours of, of this yeah and, and you know you go back to from what i understand uh the, the creators of the show write the pilot then you hire the writers to work the room and then what you do is you go through the whole we also write a bible we write the pilot in the bible then when we hire the writers we go through all the all the episodes that we want to write and we break the stories every single you know episode is going to have to be you know very detailed outlined uh, and then you assign writers to an episode and then they go back and write their episode and then you come back and go through it. And so that's why you see different writers, you know, throughout the season. Um, but I'm sure as a co-creator, I'm going to have the opportunity to make sure that it's, that if I need to edit it or, you know, I, I think that I'll have a level of um, quality control. I don't know what the word yeah. is, but you're putting my final. You're like, no. <laughs> um, is the Nichols, is your Horsehead Girl script available to read? Um, I think so. I mean, I don't, I, I feel like it's been online because I went on to Reddit once and someone was trying to like, you know, well, this and this and that. And I don't think that they expected me to show up in the thread. And I was like, really? Because when I wrote it, I didn't really expect it to be like on the internet with people tearing it apart, giving me notes I didn't ask for. Like that was kind of a, a rude awakening for me. So yeah. I feel like it's probably out there somewhere. Um, if you want to read it, uh, yeah. it is, so it is repped by my agents, but just email me and I will send it to you. It's fine. Got that, Jason? <laughs> okay. Um... Do you write a whole start to finish rough draft before you go back and edit it? Or do you edit it as you go? It sounds like you go back. I edit it as I go. And oh, I, you... I do, I edit it as I go actually, um, because I'll, I'll do what I call breadcrumbs. So the first, like the, the first 10 pages are easy, super easy. I would even say the first act is pretty simple. Again, you get into the second act blues is when your, your mind starts going to mush, but I will, if I'm on it, if I'm writing and writing and I'll do, you know, five, 10 pages a day. If I know where the next scene is going or what I want to keep doing, I leave myself breadcrumbs and I'll say, this should happen next or this should happen next. So that when I come and sit down the next day, I'm not just staring at this blank page. I'll go back and start at the beginning. I'll tighten it, tighten it. And then there's my notes and I'll just like add on to it and keep, keep writing. And that works for me really, really well. Um, John is asking what the genre of the script is of Horse Head Girls. It's a, it's a thriller. And what I really love is that all these meetings that I've, that I've been on, um, that's what people keep, they, you know, that's their first thing. They're like, it is a tight thriller with action and, and it's female driven. And yes, it is Native American uh, protagonist and in a world on the reservation. But um, I think what makes people most excited about it is that it is a genre script. You know, it's, it's written as a genre script. It's not, it's not cultural, it's not, you know, any of that, it's, it's hard ass. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay, so Alex is asking, for someone writing about the 1860s and the use of Native Americans in this period of time, he's juggling with the use of terms like civilized Native Americans versus not. How do you incorporate more dated history into your writing without frightening the readers in a really tense political climate? That's a big question. Um, yeah, Alex. <laughs> come on, Alex. Um, I would, if it was me, I would write it as if it was just today. Do you know what I mean? Um, if people know that if you have like a title card or whatever that says, you know, this takes place in Colorado in 1860, that's enough. That is enough for um, the rest of the people doing the film to be able to uh, wardrobe and all that. So you don't have to like, but if you're talking about civilized Indians, like I'm, as if this is dialogue, 
that one person is saying. I would assume dialogue, but I mean, if it is dialogue, then of, yeah, of course it has to be contemporaneous to that period, right? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. If that's how they spoke to and about each other, then that's just the fact, that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, it is. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it, but I, I guess if you were using it in the narrative, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that in the narrative. Definitely. Um, ben is asking, in regards to novels, I've heard authors described as either gardeners, creating the pieces and having them grow on their own, or architects, they structure everything. Are those styles also applicable to screen playwriting? Um, probably, I feel like if I had to pick between those, I would be a gardener, just based on what I said about letting everything you know, grow organically. Uh -huh. um, we're going to keep with that. Um, but there is a, there is an architecture to all of this. And that's something that you learn um, and that you, uh, is in your brain. Every, every time you sit down, you already know the architecture. That is, that's something that you can teach yourself. I taught myself. Um, that's why you take a screenwriting class. You learn the architecture and then you grow the story around that. Yeah. Um, here's a question that you and I have talked about a lot, especially since we live in Minnesota and we want to make film here, or at least like bring our people with us. Ben is asking, when you write, are you thinking, how is this possible for production to pull this off? Or is that something you leave to production studios for them to figure out on their own? Um, both. I don't do a lot of special effects. Um, I don't write anything in space yet. Um, so I'd like to think that uh, my films are producible, you know, um, and I do, the, when I did set out to write Preserve, the horror film, my main goal was I want to make this here in Minnesota. Like everything that I thought about when writing that one was how do, how does this get made here? Yeah. Um, so that is very, you know, that's a very specific thing. And you do have to think about budget you know, if you're making it yourself, especially, um, but for studios, like, you know, this Netflix, uh, thing, I'm, I'm sure they're going to have a really good, like a big budget for each episode. And that's going to be really fun to be able to, to do things that I, you know, mm -hmm. hold it right. And it'll happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think in conjunction with that, you've written some things with the idea that they're going to specific directors and knowing in sometimes what that budget is or what the hopeful budget is. And so you do probably amend certain things for that, I would yeah. assume. Yeah, you know, crowd scenes, uh, again, special effects, things that, moving cars, things like that. Uh, and again, I, I only just started understanding that practical part of production after, you know, working with you guys in Femme 101 and, and seeing how everything is put together and like, oh my gosh, it's, it's, there's a lot more moving pieces, you know. Definitely. Yeah. So. When I, uh, my daughter just wrote a script and there was like, it was all going to be outside in the middle of winter. And I'm like, I love you, but not that much. I'm not going to stand outside for 16 hours a day for three days of shooting. Rewrite these locations. So you do sometimes like, okay, maybe, maybe not. Um, Matt has another question. When you have a completed draft, what's your notes process like? Do you share it with a trusted friend? Like, how do you go about that? that? Absolutely. Um, I have, I would say, a handful of people that, that not only do I trust, but I know they're going to tell me the truth and that they know me, they know my work. And so they, you know, they know, they know what they can ask of me or they know that I could do better. Um, I'm a terrible speller. I'm terrible at grammar. Those always get called out. You know, like, I hate to say this, but um, Horsehead Girls was the first draft uh, that I sent to Nickel. Um, so again, when it got put up online and people were like, well, there's misspellings. And I'm like, okay, that was a big mistake. Um, <laughs> But it, uh, the, I, I don't really love, nobody loves notes. Nobody loves getting notes. Nobody really loves giving notes um, because you're telling somebody that the work that they put out there, their vulnerability and their, per, you know, it's taking notes is, a, is just as big an art 
as, as, as giving them. It's very hard. Uh, I don't like to hurt feelings, but I do like to tell the truth. Um, so my notes process is I will hand it over and it's usually hard copies. I love hard copies. I love feeling paper. I love, I love red pens, you know, um, and just if there's big things that need addressing, you really have to, you have to take it apart and sort of rethink it. And that's just, you know, what you have to do. And I'm not, I'm not precious about anything. I, I'm ready to take things apart. If, if a producer or a director, if the people that have the money want something changed, that's their prerogative. If they bought that script or optioned that script from me and they want something changed, absolutely, that's my job. That's my job. Yeah. Um, and I don't fight. I do not fight notes unless, you know, in my head, everything happens for a reason. So if something is like, you know, if you're taking the Jenga bot, you know, Thing out from the bottom and yeah. up down, and they don't realize it. Then I'll have to walk people backwards and say, "Well, this is here for this reason, and if you fuck it up, you know this part's gonna, you know, it's." And sometimes people don't see that part of 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 the structure that's falling apart. So I don't defend them, but I do. If there's something like that, I I have to we have to go back. <laughs> Jason said to me privately, but I'm sharing it publicly. Uh -oh. He said, "I must be weird." I love giving and getting notes. I like pain. And I will say as an actor, I, I, I find it, if you're working with the right director, it's collaborative. If a director's like, what do you think about this? Or even way more directive, like, no, I didn't like that. I'm like, cool, let's try something else. And notes help you either defend something because it's there for a reason or look at it from a different perspective. Um, I know we're wrapping up this hour. I want, if anyone has a message that, or like a question, feel free to unmute and let's maybe give Winona five more minutes of, of quick questions before we let her get back to drinking that box of wine she has on her desk. <laughs> Rip my pitches down and get at it. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any more questions than they've put, put up? Feel free to jump in. Joey did say, I take direction better as an actor than I do a writer, which I can totally understand that too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's very hard to look someone in the face and, and, and watch their face drop. <laughs> it's, it's, hard. It's, it's no fun. Yeah, yeah. Hard Writing is hard work. You put a lot into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything? Yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering if you try to write to trends or try to anticipate trends, like how do you avoid, you know, writing something to a wave that might have, it might pass you by by the time something gets made or, or anticipate something of interest or you just ignore that altogether and write from the gut? Um, I write from the gut and nothing, I, it never works out for me to hit the zeitgeist. The one time that I did, um, something that I had just written came out already that was almost exactly like it to the T and that kind of hurt my feelings. Um, you know, it's the whole thing. If, if werewolves are hot now, they won't be hot by the time you finish your script. So I, I like to write whatever makes me excited because you're going to have to sit with those pages for so long that if you can't, you know what I mean? If you can't, stick with it for months at a time it, and you're just doing it just to see if it might maybe sell that you're not going to get that great feeling at the end of the script you know if you're writing it for you and then you feel good and you're like i don't care if it's not popular and then then you still feel good at the end of the day and but, but i think also i would say you've done an incredible job just maybe being in that zeitgeist world because like Horsehead Girls touched a lot of very, very salient points that people were looking for. They wanted a female protagonist. They wanted a person of, of color, at, you know, leading. And we also want, wanted like a goddamn superhero that was also just a, a, per, a woman. And, and she felt relatable and the sense of injustice is very palatable. Thank you. I think I got lucky because I've been writing Native women for 20 years and it caught up to me finally. You know what I mean? And I've, yeah. I've been 
I've been uh, talking to other production companies about now writing Native women. And, you know, I've been sitting across tables of white men and they're like, you've been right all along. And I'm like, really? You know, like, it's, just, <laughs> it's what I write. It's, you know, it's relatable to me. So. Yeah. Yeah, the world has taken quite a while to catch up, so. <laughs> it has taken a long time. Well, welcome, good old boys club. Welcome. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. This has been freaking amazing and really, really fun. Um, if you do want to email Winona to get that script, um, we, can, we can give out your email address. Is that okay? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. And... Also, we're gonna be continuing to do our Men With Monday series. If you guys have someone that you think would be amazing or you want a topic discussed, please let us know. We're trying to find really good ways to bring um, education to the rest of us so that we can use this time to actually evolve a little bit. Um, and please just keep in contact with us. We're really excited about stuff that's going on in Minnesota, stuff that's going on in Winona's life. And I think Kelly wants to say something just really quick about um, our community and how mm -hmm. if you wanna get involved a little bit, you can. First of all, Winona, these are our silent hands. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Amanda, for um, giving me a minute. We have, we're excited to uh, announce that we've started an online community. You can find it at minwift.mn.co. I posted it in the chat. And this will be a place where we can all gather and have conversations. We can continue this conversation about writing there. Um, we'd love for all of you to join us online. It'll be um, a place where our members can uh, subscribe. So if you want to become a member of Minwift, you can do that there. Um, but also, it's also a, a welcome place for anybody who just wants to become a supporter of MinWift. And you can find all of our upcoming MinWift Monday events there. And we'll be posting this video on that uh, platform as well. And starting in 2021, we're going to be teaching some cool classes. And it'll be kind of a one-stop shop. Like, consider it our, our online headquarters for MinWift where we can do all sorts of cool stuff. So I can't wait to see you all on minwift.mn.co. Thank you everybody for joining us. It's so good to see human faces that aren't my teenagers. <laughs> and yeah, if you have any questions, just be sure we, we're very, very reachable. My email address is amanda at amandaday.com. And uh, shoot, shoot me any questions you have. I can get Winona's email out to you and then you can pour over her script and it's a good, it's a good read. You won't be putting it down. <laughs> good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank good you. Night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Winona. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Winona. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Winona. Thanks, Amanda. Great job. Oh my God, I, I just pushed leave meeting, but I'm not. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. I haven't picked up my finger yet. It's like I'm stepping out of mine. <laughs> oh my God, I'm gonna stop.